You know, I, I, when I was first go, traveling to the Soviet Union, I was shocked by somebody who said, of course we have complete free speech here, she said. We just don't allow people to lie. Well, you can say that now and nobody finds it funny. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Hi, Bethany. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you, Luigi. Happy anniversary to you, too. Do you know what anniversary is this? I do, actually. We have been doing this podcast now for a year, which is actually just shocking. I'm not sure. I mean, that's a happy thing, but the year has just disappeared, hasn't it? As it has for so many of us in this strange time. Yeah, I don't know what is the pandemic or the age, but this year is five faster and faster every year. <laughs> But I sorry I should have said, it was so fantastic to work with you all the time. That time flew. <laughs> uh, yeah, me too. I guess I could have led with that as well. <laughs> but, no, but no, seriously, I, I, being able to debate really interesting and discuss really interesting topics with you actually has been a highlight of this year. And I hope our listeners have enjoyed it as, as, as much as we have. Speaking of, when we started, I think we had a, a very ambitious program, which was not only to discuss capitalism, but also to discuss what I consider, and I think you consider, a fundamental building block of capitalism, which is to have a democracy underlying. So we're always looking for a way to explore the link between capitalism and democracy. And that's why we were drawn to a new book by Northwestern professors Martin Shapiro and Saul Gorson. And their new book is called Minds Wide Shut. And what they put forward in this book is that the open debate is key to democracy. Without open debate, we, we can't actually have a democracy. So their book is basically a plea in, in most ways for, for freedom of speech. And this is very important because not only they bring their professorial knowledge, but Morty has also been uh, president of Northwestern for many years and so brings his experience as a president of a university. And universities are at the center of this debate in this moment. So I thought one of the incredibly important things you two did in this book was define what fundamentalism is and what it isn't. And so I thought a good place to start would be for you to explain how you mean the word and then how it has been misused over time. And maybe, Morty, we can start with you and maybe turn to Saul to talk about how it's been misused over time. You know, for me, when I think about fundamentalism, I think back of the great philosopher of science from Cambridge, Karl Popper, that there are no evidence at all that anybody can present to you that make you change your mind, then you're a fundamentalist in that thinking. And it's important for everyone to realize that there are certain things they believe that make them fundamentalist. And if you don't have any of those, then as, as one reviewer said, you, you want to keep your minds wide open, but not so wide open that your brain falls out, right? So there's certain things I believe that Saul believes, Luigi, you believe, I'm sure Bethany, you believe, that make us fundamentalist. But if it's most of what we believe that it's not, not falsifiable, you have a problem, and I think democracy has a problem. But so, well, you can use you know a keyword like that in many ways as long as you use it consistently. And when I found out with most of the people who write about it, start out with one concept, and then when they want to denounce something else, somehow call that fundamentalist too, without realizing they've changed their definitions in the process. And that's just sloppy thinking, right? I'm I'm a Russian specialist, and it was you know Lenin is is a perfect example of it that the truth is perspicuous perfectly evident when you look at it. What do you mean all the stuff that we may not know the world, that our minds may shape what we see? That's nonsense. The world's exactly the way we see it. Anyone who doesn't see it that way is trying to enslave the working class, that kind of argument. If the truth is absolutely clear, then there's no room for honest disagreement. The concept of opinion in any meaningful sense disappears. You know, there's no two opinions about the Pythagorean theorem, and there's no different opinions about socialism. That, that, that would be the kind, or about God, that would be, you know, the kind of thinking. And once you have that notion, everything that democracy depends on disappears. It depends on respect for people of different opinions, you know, power changes hands, you know, you have to have a notion that you might be wrong. It's just what you believe you would be strong. It's simply an opinion. God didn't reveal himself to you directly. 
democracy depends on that notion of uh, kind of humility about what you know, the very opposite of fundamentalist thinking. Friends of mine and I talk about with the rise in a secular society, the remnants of religion are leaking into our, our society. And I sometimes wonder if some of what we're talking about is almost inevitable in, in an increasingly secular society and that people are craving the certainty that used to be offered by God and other forms of belief. And I was thinking back to the brothers Karamazov and, you know, the, the famous line, well, if there is no God, th then what? And I wonder how, how you see that, Saul. Is it inevitable that in an increasingly secular world, we are other forms of fundamentalism are going to rise as, as a replacement? That's a great question. I, I, I would give two answers to that. One is, you know, one of my favorite lines of G.K. Chesterton is that the problem with atheists is not that they believe nothing, but that they will believe anything. If they have God, it limits them. But if they don't, they find something, right? And But the other is that, you know, America was founded by religious zealots. That spirit ex continues to exist in America, the puritanical spirit, if you want to know, or other religions. You know, even after belief in religion goes, that is part of the American spirit. So Americans tend to this sort of strong moralism. That's how we had prohibition, you know, at one point. It's taking another form. So it's always been a tension in America, right? Between, you know, the, the ideals of freedom from the enlightenment and, you know, the ideals of, of certainty in one form or another, right? You, you detail in your book this move toward what you call Leninist thinking, and it includes a culture of denunciation in order to ensure one's purity in one's own group. And I was thinking as I read that, how is that different than cancel culture today? <clears throat> and would you say that cancel culture is part of a move toward Leninist thinking? Well, cancel culture hasn't gone remotely as far as Leninist thinking. You know, it goes in that direction, but there's a long way, you know, so it's a danger. It's, we're not there. One of Lenin's key arguments was you do not address the other person's arguments. You bloody his face. Don't address the arguments. <clears throat> you, you insult the person, you humiliate the person, you make it so that he can't show his face. That's how you answer. You never address arguments. And that's, of course, the way can, you know, some of the cancel culture people, not all of them work. Right. <clears throat> you want I would just say, you know, they're not sending us to the gulags yet. Uh, I haven't checked my email yet today. But there are aspects that remind me a little bit of the more of China, the cultural revolution, the public shaming, wearing your dunce cap. Uh, Malte, they, 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 they don't send you to China, but they start to make you fear for your life. As you know, when I invited Steve Bannon to debate a colleague on campus, I had people putting on my backyard, writing fascist. They had threats. I fear for, for my life and the life of my family. So I don't think we're that far off. But I think that intolerance, in my view, arises from fear. Because you fear to lose out. You fear not to have a good argument. You fear the confrontation. One of the things I learned from the experience of trying to get uh, Bannon on campus is, number one, that eventually he didn't come because he feared actually debating with Austin goes At least that's my interpretation. But the other part is that uh, when I spoke with the students, one of my, uh, the students at Chicago said, wait a second, what about if we lose the debate? I said, kids, if we lose the debate, you don't want to know and try to get better argument? Don't you want to know in advance rather than sort of a shutdown? My fear is that we are raising a generation of people who are too fearful to even entertain some of the fundamental ideas or debate on those fundamental ideas. But there's another interpretation other than, than fear, uh, and this would be the Leninism. Lenin was not afraid of anybody. <clears throat> it is the idea that you're interested in finding out the better arguments and the truth presupposes that you do not already know the absolute truth. But if you do, the only relevant thing is what gives you more power. They're not worried about being proven wrong. They're worried about what will give them less power. Luigi, I just add one thing here. So you, you, you described uh unfortunate uh, ramifications for you and your family because of the, you know, what happened then a, a couple years ago. Can you imagine being 20 years old and living in a dorm after you've been canceled? I was thinking as you were talking that fear takes lots of forms, right? So using fear as a blanket word can often be misleading because there's fear of being thrown out of the group, fear of losing power, but there's also fear of loss of certainty, right? And so that goes yeah. to the core, oh, yeah. the, the, the core of your book, that, that yeah. loss of certainty is a really scary thing. And what you're advocating in some ways is, is a loss of certainty. A very good point. But Gary, if I may say, I, I love your uh, uh, clarification because I think you're right. I spent too much time around academia where at least you will assume that people don't think they know the truth, but they are searching for the truth. 
and you hope that they are not only single-minded focusing on power. But I think in the real world, I think there is the second category. But I, I am shocked that even in the world of academia, where we should be raised saying that the truth is doesn't exist. It's, it's something that you try to achieve, but uh, is always changing. And as you said, if you study history, you know how many times the consensus of the time was absolutely wrong. One of the most depressing experiences I had during the, this pandemic is looking at social media, how a lot of distinguished academics, not only in economics, but in epidemiology, etc., were insulting each other, asserting truth that were proven wrong the next day, and so on and so forth. And, and I thought that that was really a big problem that we need to address. Well, you know, in another age, if you wanted to claim that you can't be wrong, you claim God spoke to me. In our age, you claim this is science and science is absolutely settled, okay? <clears throat> and the fact is, if you say that, you don't understand science because science is not a solid block of dogma. Some things are better established and some things are less established. Anyone who treats it as a solid block where everything is equally certain can't explain how science progresses. It progresses because some of the things that are on the frontier are less certain. People, including scientists, have abused the claim of science in the last year. <clears throat> Look, first we were told only fanatics could possibly even entertain the possibility that the, that the virus escaped from a Chinese lab. And you're a racist if you think so. Now it turns out, gee, that may be the case. People were thrown off, you know, Facebook. for, for And it was dead in the name of science. And I, I couldn't believe it when, you know, just as the pandemic was beginning, um, Dr. Fauci said, masks don't help. Don't wear masks. It doesn't matter. And then a month later, he said, I only said that because there was a shortage of masks and I didn't want people to use them up. If the chief spokesman said he deliberately lied, why would anybody believe him after that? <laughs> uh, so I, want, I wanted to come back to your, uh, because I, was, I started thinking as I read this book, you're an economist, Luigi's an economist. And I loved, of course, when I got to the chapter on market fundamentalism. And I started to wonder as I read that chapter, is part of the loss of belief in capitalism and the questioning of capitalism, the fault of market fundamentalism, that it was supposed to be absolute and an answer for everything. And because it's not, and because we've refused to acknowledge that it's not, that's caused a, a lack of faith in capitalism in the same way that not allowing questions about science has caused a uh, uh, questioning about about belief in science. Yeah, I think there's some truth to that, Bethany. But uh, just like the negative fundamentalism in, in the academy with uh, deconstructionists, there's no such thing as great literature. I, I think there's a broader distrust of capitalism that really worries me among Generation Z. If there's anything I ever thought that was put to bed with the end of the Cold War was this idea that private ownership of the means of production might not be the best way to lead to growth and prosperity um, since it's, and maybe I'm a fundamentalist in that sense. I mean, I, I just can't envision any alternative to capitalism. Uh, and I don't, I don't think it's because the far right misunderstood Adam Smith. You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, the market fundamentalism, I think it's just the rise of, of this anti-fundamentalism, uh, anti-market fundamentalism complete distress of capitalism on certain faculties and certain fields and a larger percentage of Gen Z than previous generations. And I, I, I think that's actually the scariest thing. I, I really do. I even hear, hear other, you know, presidents of colleges, and universities, when we get arguments, you know, I'm big on Pell grants and all these things and increasing opening our doors to talented low-income kids from, you know, all over the world. And they say, oh no, you know, one of them said to me recently more, you don't understand, you know, you're just, it's old kind of liberal, it's capitalism. Until we get rid of capitalism, you know, we're always going to have no dialogue and incredible unrest and, and, and all that. And I'm like, and replace it with what? I mean, I, I, it's like democracy. It's uh, no joke, you know, it's far from perfect, but what's better, right? And it's the same about capitalism. And you can have enlightened capitalism, but, you know, the distrust, particularly on the far left uh, about private ownerships and the mean of production. So I, I find it's terrifying as an economist. You know, there is a consensus, I think, among most economists, at least 90, 95% of us about where the minimum wage should be, how you deal with climate change and on and healthcare, on and on and on. And we, we have, that we're full of, fun. not about the wealth tax, which we, and there's some things we still legitimately disagree about, but mostly I, I think we know a lot of answers to policies and people on, not, I don't worry on the right, I worry on the far left, that they just don't believe our numbers, they don't believe our data, they don't believe incentives matter. And that, you know, we need a living, a living wage should be $25 an hour, even though that would wreak havoc for low-income people back on studies from the great Alan Kruger and, and, and 
you know, stop being ideologues and just look at the damn data. It's one of the non-economists in this conversation, um, the English major in me is popping up. And what I really liked was this line in, in this chapter that, that you wrote, there's all the difference in the world between thinking that markets generally work and ruling out exceptions on principle. And so I think that's what I mean by market fundamentalism. And that's where I think economists and market people generally go wrong is that they refuse to rule out the exceptions. And I think that does a great deal of damage in the same way that this belief that science as this hard, fast rock does does damage because it, it refuses to allow for the places where it doesn't work, and then it causes a deeper uh, a deeper skepticism on the part of people who say, "But wait, that that didn't work as you promised." Well, that point's well taken, but I would just add the whole question, Luigi, about trade offs, which is what economics is about. And if you say, you know, what, what's the great line? So that uh, it's it's the Latin line: it's better to die than make a trade off. Let justice reign, though the world perish, is, is a Latin. Yeah, well, economics is not letting the world perish because justice abstractly is supposed to reign. It's about, you know, depending whether it's the greatest good for the greatest number, whatever you could define what our objective function looks like. But, you know, the idea that trade-offs are immoral, that, you know, you have to go all in on, you know, on, on environmental protections, even if it means that a massive loss in efficiency and well-being is, is you know, for an economist, ludicrous. But so let, let's look at the other side, because we interview for the second episode on, on meritocracy, Michael Sandel. And I think he had a excellent point, which is uh, this uh, meritocratic society tends to delegate to experts, even political choices. Everything becomes a technocratic choice. But at the end, there are a lot of political choice behind the technocracy. And I think that the example that Gary presented of Fauci is the most blatant in that series. So he was acting as an expert, but making a political choice that we might determine whether it's right or wrong of, of uh, limiting the use of masks to people who most need. Uh, he did not make it on a political term. We're making a political choice to take responsibility. He was hiding behind science to do that. And I think that uh, everybody's responsible, but we economists are particularly responsible on that. While it might be not the most efficient way to use the money to, for example, increase the wage or do other things, maybe politically that's the right thing to do. And we economists need to take a step back and say, look, this will cost you X, but at the end of the day, I am not the person deciding that should be a political decision. So what can we do? You, you, you want an important university. What can we do to train our faculty to be a bit more humble? and give advice without pretending to be God. We're not God, and we shouldn't pretend to be one. Yes, yeah, Saul, you're pausing. I mean, that's it. That's oh, only I'm God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's what we all believe on some level, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think Mike Sandel's got, you know, I'm also a big fan of his, and I, I think he has a lot of good points. But Saul, what, what about training? I mean, Luigi's challenge here, you know, faculty to be um, more open. I mean, it, I think part of it is showing the humility of your own and, and of your own field where it's appropriate. Part of it is modeling that kind of thing. But Saul, you've been thinking long and hard about this for a long time. Yeah, I mean, part of the idea behind our class was different disciplines are not just, you know, have different subject matter. They conceive the world differently. Right? What counts as a good question? What counts as a good evidence? So if we could take certain issues and show how, let's say, a humanist, a sociologist, an economist would all conceive of that issue, see it differently, find different things of significance, come up with different answers, they would be able, when they take the class each of those disciplines, the fundamentals of the disciplines aren't questioned. But if you can bring them on the same issues together, you could view each discipline from the inside and the outside, how it looks to somebody else. And then its claims of absoluteness would be qualified, you see. But within a discipline, everybody just accepts the assumptions and doesn't do that. But if you can view disciplines in interaction with each other, then you could have the idea that, you know, the claims of certainty seem appealing but wrong. And if that's true of disciplines, it's probably true elsewhere. They also get graded, Saul, in terms, mainly in terms of how successfully they argue against their underlying belief. You know, some of them really, at least in the course evaluation, Saul, say that I wasn't just arguing the opposing point. I actually started to see for the first time there is an opposing point that has some possible validity. And Gen Z, that's a tough argument to, uh, to make for many of them. What we've learned from our course and our engagement with this generation of students, some things work, some things don't work. I mean, you could try to say, hey, you know, the Las Vegas thing, right? What, what happens here stays here. 
this is a safe space. You know, you can argue whatever you want. And uh, it's very difficult to pull. You know, when I give the talk to the students, you know, I mean, do I say, hey, speak your mind? And I say, be careful. You know, if you're in an audience where people are not really listening and they're just waiting to pounce on any anything you say that could be interpreted in a, in a bad way, don't say it, you know, be careful. Have your spaces with your friends where you can work on your arguments and build your confidence. You know, a safe space doesn't mean you don't have difficult dialogue. In my experience, you have the most difficult dialogue because you're not afraid of being canceled. And that gives you some serenity and some peace and some confidence that you can bring that out to the broader world. At least that's my experience. You know, I, I would, you know, of course I can't do this, but if I could, I would require two classes of <laughs> at a university, one in microeconomics, so they understand trade-offs and one in Soviet history. So they understand what happens when you have only one point of view and forbid other people, people to read other books, you know, th those two classes would go a long way, <laughs> you know? You know, I, I, when I was first go, traveling to the Soviet Union, I was shocked by somebody who said, of course we have complete free speech here, she said. We just don't allow people to lie. Well, you can say that now and nobody finds it funny. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was actually thinking it sums, it sums up our culture today very well. <laughs> but but Morty, isn't the, the first sort of safe space, the one, and I don't want to be too much self-serving, but for faculty, because I think in, in increasingly so in a lot of schools, faculty get in trouble and not for saying racially charged stuff, but for saying things that are simply different ideas and they can uh, be really uh, cancel or attack or, or marginalize. Increasingly, the administration is not protecting them. I have to say, I have a fantastic president that, that uh, defended uh, the freedom of speech all through, but uh, it's more the exception than, than the rule. I, as a result of that, I spoke with a lot of faculty who have very different experiences and, and president and provost that behind doors say, look, we wouldn't mind if you get a job somewhere else. And that's really reminiscent of the McCarthy era uh, on the opposite side of the political spectrum, but still in that direction. Well, I, I mean, if that's the case and that's more ubiquitous, then you know, that's an enormous problem. You know, I think presidents and provosts and deans need to stick to... Uh, the highest principles that any college or university pretends to as espouse and, and, and provost who are wanting to be presidents, you know, once they get canceled, that's over. Presidents, it depends on where they are with their terms, uh, if they want to get reappointed or not. So it's, it's, you know, tough situation for everybody. And I think most of us, you know, make those right decisions. I know I have always tried to, have been always been very well received, protecting people across the ideological spectrum. But, you know, I've always felt that's what our university is, is about. And if it's not protected, the only other thing I'd say, Luigi, I mean, if you can't have dialogue among faculty, colleges and universities, where the hell are you going to have it? But, sorry if I interrupt. I, I want to point out, because you said something that scares the hell out of me, i.e. that if you are a provost today and you end up on being canceled, this impacts your career. And so they yeah. only, no? What? Yeah, yeah. And, and or so dean basically, or department chair. And, and, so, and so, and so, the at the end of the day, if I am today, if I am a provost or a dean, the way in which I will uh, make career is by not alienating the people who can cancel you that tend to be mostly on the extreme left. And so, I would like to prevent any discussion that challenge issues from, from that area. Well, yeah, again, Luigi, it's about incentives, you know, it depends. I mean, a lot of people say, hey, you know, those of us in administration who continue to teach and publish, um, you know, aren't afraid about going back to the faculty. But if you really want to take on these tough issues, I mean, the reason it used to be public voices, you know, presidents of all these institutions used to write very controversial op-eds on the topics of the day. Now, most presidents write, give me more Pell Grants and support sponsored research. That's really controversial, those topics, right? Uh, and the few of us left who actually write, you know, about safe spaces or cancel culture or this or that, you know, yeah, of course you put your careers on the line. But, you know, if, if you're a department chair who wants to be a dean or a dean who wants to be a provost or provost who wants to be a president and you take on controversial issues and, you know, you're going to be, there's going to be a search committee that's going to Google you and they're going to see about the protests against you and being canceled. It's going to make it very difficult to get a job. So that's responding to incentives. Now, I hope that's a pendulum 
that's swinging back the other way. So all thinks the metaphor is a snowball. So going down a hill, creating an avalanche of distrust and lack of dialogue that leads to the demise of democracy it scares the hell out of me. But of course, when you study Russia, you know, that's where you end up with. But I, I, I do think it's a pendulum. I already think the election of, of Joe Biden and other things are showing that we are swinging back a little. And I think that you know, uh, uh, college administrators should be leaders there. Well, this was fascinating. Thank you both so much for your time. And uh, Morty, it was delightful to see you again after all these years. And it was great to meet you, Saul. And best of luck with the book. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank it you was so a pleasure. Much. Thank, Thank you. you. So did the conversation surprise you at all, Luigi? Was it what you expected? I was really impressed by Saul Mawson. He saw the lim limitation of what I said. And I think that in the spirit of learning from others and not fighting, I have to say that he really opened my mind on a point regarding the use of intolerance as a strategy to gain more power. I think he's right. We can interpret a lot of what is going on today as a desire to gain power through intolerance rather than uh, through democratic means. I think that is interesting and it goes to the bigger point that we all have we all have a little bit of a fundamentalist mindset in us, right? In certain ways and you sometimes have to poke and prod around your own brain to discover where your own fundamentalism is. And sometimes it can lie in tolerance of of no tolerance and sometimes it can lie in no tolerance for tolerance anyway. But it but it's complicated within all of us. Yeah, I, I guess the question is whether you become intolerant of what 1% of the population does or when you become intolerant about what 49% of the population does or even worse, uh, 75 And so in, in particular, I was shocked that a sitting president of a major university will tell us that uh, basically no university administrator who wants to continue and, and progress in his career as university administrator is willing to take any risk offending some of the vocal minorities that are gonna cancel him or her. I kind of suspected that, but said so bluntly by somebody with authority, I see this as the terrible direction that we are going. Uh, it, during the, the episode in which I was uh, attacked for, for the Bannon thing, a professor sent me an email say, how could you do something that so much offend the sensitivity of a lot of other people. And I said, you know, I come from Padua, and one of the things that you do when you're there, you visit this amphitheater where they used to do anatomy when this was prohibited by the church. And I said, you know, thank God that they do it, because, for example, the fallopian tubes were discovered by a guy called Fallopio, who actually dissected cadavers because you cannot figure it out that they are the fallopian tubes without dissecting cadavers. And later I realized even the entire circulation of blood, Andrea Vesalio was a student at Padova and he got the sense of how the blood was circulating thanks to cutting bodies. And so thank God that people did something that at the time was considered repugnant to a lot of other members of the society in name of actually research and study. Obviously, you can say that that's, that's a completely different argument from saying something that might be offensive to someone else. But, it's, but, but the, line is, the line is hard. What's, what's offensive to someone else? I got into an argument with uh, my nieces, who are high school students, both very, very, very smart girls. And they were effectively arguing, you're not a bad person if you upset someone else, but you are a bad person if you trigger someone else. And I said, well, how is anybody supposed to know in advance what the line is, what the line is between those two things? And once you're labeled a bad person by everyone in your peer group, well, there aren't very many people who are going to take the risk of that, whether they're a college administrator who wants to advance or a high school student who wants to have friends. And so you're obviously going to stay as far to one side of that line as you possibly can on any topic that might be controversial so that you don't, you don't risk the, the punishment for having done something you didn't intend to do. Actually, what scientists at the time were doing and saying was offensive. When Galileo Galilei said that actually he is the earth moving around the sun and not the other way around, was blasphemy. It's hard to imagine, but at the time, people were so religious that this was up deeply upsetting them. It might end up being the truth, but it was upsetting, and they didn't want to hear. Yep. 
Yep. It's fascinating because in, in their book, they, they compare that mindset that you want a Galilean mindset, an open mindset, and a mindset that things might not be as you perceive them to be, rather than a Potomalaic consciousness, which is this is the way the world works and it's fixed. Yeah, I think as a scientist, you should never have that approach. I think that this is the, the greatest discovery of the Western world is the scientific mind open to be wrong. I think that's funny about today's uh, cry um, to believe in science. We believe in the science. We even see signs in some people's yards. We believe in the science. When in, in reality, believing in the science is sort of the opposite of the scientific mindset, right? Because believing in the science is a hard and fast thing is not the scientific mindset, <laughs> which is being, it's the opposite of the scientific mindset, which is being open to the idea that what you think might be wrong, being able to weigh the real world evidence from it and say, is this right or is, is, is this wrong? And what we want is for people to believe in the scientific mindset, not to believe in the science, right? It's just such a, a misnomer or such an abdication of everything that science actually is. I, I agree completely with you, but uh, what are the causes of all this? But one of the hypotheses that was thrown out there, which I find it very, very intriguing, lack of religion might be the cause of this fundamentalism. I think it's really fascinating with friends of mine. Friends of mine and I are obsessed by the ways in which the religious mindset is leaking over into other aspects of, of society. There's this great anecdote in the, in, in the book about how, you know, in, in the past, you wouldn't, a Protestant wouldn't marry a Catholic. That would be just horrifying or would cause all sorts of societal um, upheaval. And now... Nobody even raises an eyebrow at that, but you wouldn't see a Democrat marry a Republican, and you wouldn't you wouldn't even invite Democrats and Republicans to the same dinner party. Um, so the divides are just forming. The religious belief is just forming in, in other areas of my life. And back to your point, one of my father's favorite books, which we talk about a lot, is indeed a Russian a Russian novel, and it's the Brothers Karamazov, because at one point in the book, the the, the main character essentially says, "If God is dead, well, well, then what?" And instead of that being incredibly freeing, it's well, if if there's if there's nothing, then no rules apply. And I think in the face of that terror, we search for certainty in other areas of life. And so we double down on the certainty we find in, in other beliefs, which I don't really like. I was raised an atheist. And so I like to believe that they can be two entirely separate phenomenon. But, but there's certainly, they're certainly a causal link. Well, it's interesting because I was raised a Catholic and I did not raise really my children Catholic. And now I think maybe I made a mistake because you want to experience a fundamentalism to be free for the rest of your life. So one of the reasons why I believe in so much in the importance of freedom is because uh, I experience what it means when there is some fundamentalism and, and how sort of terrible that is. Yeah, maybe we all need both of that. Maybe being raised in total freedom does just encourage this, not existential despair, but existential sort of um, search for something that you can hang, hang all your beliefs on. Have you ever wondered what goes on inside a black hole, or why time only moves in one direction, or what is really so weird about quantum mechanics? Well, then you should listen to Why This Universe. On this podcast, you'll hear about the strangest and most interesting ideas in physics, broken down by physicists Dan Hooper and Shalma Wegsman. If you want to learn about our universe, from the quantum to the cosmic, you won't want to miss Why This Universe, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Can I return to the issue that actually bugs me the most is what can we do about this uh, rising fundamentalism? Yeah, I, I liked their optimism that the way in which they were inspiring students to debate in classes was a way of encouraging these very kind of conversations that, that we need to have to ha have a healthy democracy. And I admired, from an intellectual point of view, I thought it was very clever to turn Morty's defense of safe spaces into this idea that in a safe space is a place where any kind of conversation can happen. But I wondered as they said that, but how often does any kind of conversation happen within a sp safe space? And is this an intellectual wish list? I think it was intellectually clever and something to aspire to, but I wondered how that played out in practice. And I think back to your point about university administrators or anybody who cares about their career, if you realize what the stakes are, well, then of course you're going to play it safe. And so if, and if we all play it safe, then conversation grinds to a halt. But it's interesting. There's that old saying, right? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I think today's youth has come to believe the opposite, maybe because there isn't such a threat of sticks and stones in many environments anymore. And so it's the 
who cares about sticks and stones? Words, of course, will hurt me, and therefore you you can't say them. And I, I see that. I actually think words are incredibly powerful and can do an, an enormous amount of damage. So I'm not advocating for a simple solution here. And I love that today's youth are more intent on not hurting each other than we ever were. I mean, the bullying we all grew up with was was relentless and, and quite horrible. But I worry that it's just a different form of bullying. I think that I think the best argument in, in defense of this is that it's meant to make the world a better place, right? It's meant to allow everybody to have a chance and an opportunity and to coexist together in a, in a way that people are allowed to maximize their abilities because they're not constantly being stomped down by microaggressions or macroaggressions other people saying things that decimate them such that they, they, they can't function. And I think that's a really laudable goal, actually. I am a little bit worried about the way in which that, that goal is being implemented. Not in all cases, but I'm worried when the way that goal is being implemented results in squashing free speech, because I really do believe, the, agree with the authors of, 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 of this book, that the, the foundation of democracy is disagreement. And it's really hard to disagree if you're really terrified of the consequences. And, and I think that the, sorry, the, the, the line between the two is very simple. If I don't like what you say, I should have the freedom not to listen to you and to ignore it. If I don't like what you say and I start to try to shame you into a shaming other into isolating you, then I am trying to use social pressure. And that is typical of repressing regimes from the fundamentalist religious people to the Leninist to the Maoist and uh, every sort of, and the fascist, in which uh, they use social pressure to scare and intimidate people. I think that that is the fundamental distinction between a democratic society and a totalitarian society. I think Nazis are terrible, but why do I need to shame them in front of others? Because the moment I start shaming them, then the question is, do they have the right to exist? I I've lived through the Italy in the 1970s when people say that uh, killing a fascist was an act of love. Why? Because if you have a fascist, you don't have the right to speak. Uh, if you don't have the right to speak, do you have the right to exist? If you don't have the right to exist, killing you is, is something that I not only I can do, I should do. And, and that really goes straight to fundamentalism. I don't know. I think all of these things, it's much harder to find the line because I think shame is one of the most powerful tools we, we have. And I, I actually, I disagree with you. I think there are certain ideas that are utterly re, utterly repulsive and abhorrent and people should be made to feel shame for, for having them. And then the question is, where is that line between that and other ideas that people might find hurtful? And I find that a, I find that a hard line to, 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 to define for other people. I can define it for myself. And then I would say, well, shame is okay, but it's not not okay to subject somebody to loss of income or loss of loss of life because you disagree with their ideas. But back to our discussion about the university professor, then what is the line? If somebody in the university is expressing ideas that other people find morally repugnant and abhorrent, should that person suffer the consequences, not just of shame, but of inability to advance their career? Again, a slippery line. I could say where I would where I would draw that line. But I, I, again, it's, it's hard to set it in stone for, for other people, I, I think. But again, I think that the, the story, my story of dissecting cadavers, dissecting cadavers was repugnant for most people at that time and would have been a terrible idea to shame people to uh, not do that, it would have uh, delayed the, the discoveries and the progress in, in medicine by centuries. I'm not saying that I don't think that it's shameful to be an Nazis. I do think that. And, and I would say individually a person, uh, to a person that I, I'm uh, abhorred by, the, by those ideas. But from there to basically do moral lynching, it's a different story. And I, I don't know what is the right line. We, we now all agree that Hitler was terrible. Now, what about Mao Stalin? They weren't much better, okay? And, and then, so, and you keep going, it's a slippery slope. And then uh, you can go to... Uh, Dick Cheney, I had a faculty member who said, oh, uh, Dick Cheney is a war criminal and it, it should be, uh, it's shameful and uh, doesn't have the right to, to speak anywhere. And then basically when you, it's a slippery slope, you don't know what you draw the line.
I, I agree with you. I, I think you are more, I think you are more intellectually consistent on this topic than, than I am because I'm having trouble finding a place where I would draw a line for the rest of the world in terms of when someone should be shamed and when, and when they shouldn't be and when they should be threatened with the loss of their livelihood um, and, and when they shouldn't be. I think one place that I can be very certain of is that people should not be threatened with the loss of their life for expressing an idea that other people find morally repugnant. But if you're taking away somebody's ability to make an income forever and ever and ever, um, how far away from that is actually taking away oh dear my dog had something to say on this front from, from taking away their life but I, I have trouble because in, in general I'm, I'm drawn to this book uh, I'm terrified of the notion of minds wide shut I agree with you on your example of cadavers and the great advances in the world have come from people saying and doing things that they, that they weren't supposed to do I struggle to find, to find an intellectually consistent standpoint on this So Luigi and I thought it would be fun to launch this new segment as part of Capital Isn't, where we'd discuss some news of the week and decide if it's a capital is or a capital isn't. And I'm going to blame Luigi for suckering me into a conversation about soccer, something about which I know nothing. And so we made a mistake on the podcast, as many listeners pointed out to us. And thank you for pointing out the mistake. I suggested that Messi should have taken less than 50 percent, more than more than a 50 percent pay cut without realizing that the rules of the didn't didn't permit him to do so. So please uh, let us know when uh, we make mistakes. That's very valuable, but we try not to make more of that. <laughs> <laughs> let, let us know when we make mistakes and let us know when you, we, when you disagree with us too, because we can all, also learn a lot from what you all think, and we enjoy that. So on to this week's Capital Is, Capital Is. Many of you may have read about one of the more gigantic swings that I've seen in business in recent years in which the subscription service called Only Fans, which allows um, a feed of images and videos that are often too racy for Instagram, they announced that they were going to kick any sort of sexual activity starting in October off the site, uh, totally. And in a dramatic swing, the creators who have sort of made Only Fans possible and lucrative rebelled and only fans reversed its decision and said it would continue to allow these creators um, to be hosted on its site. So Luigi, what do you think of this? Oh, I think that is a very interesting and apropos for what we'll discuss today because uh, on the one end we see the credit card processor were exerting pressure on uh, only fans not to accept sex workers. But then there was a a revolt of the founder and uh, many of the participants that push the company in the other direction. So here we see workers on one end and the financier on a different end. Right. Yeah, which is which is a fascinating dynamic because you normally think in sex work that the workers are being exploited by the, by the all-powerful owner of a site or in the old world a, a, a pimp. And in this case, the workers felt like they weren't being exploited. This was their means of making, making their living. And so it's a reversal of what many of us would think of as the age-old dynamic of how this stuff works. Although I'm still unclear as to why the payment processors ultimately reversed their decision, I actually think that overall the entire story is a, a, a capital is. The site tried to do something that was economic pressure from their, their payment processor saying, we won't continue to allow you to do this. So they responded and then they realized, oh dear, we can't survive without this content. Look at how much we're going to lose if we allow this to go through. So we need to figure out an alternative in order to go forward. And it was the economic, economic power gained by a group of creators um, being together and saying, we're, we're we're all gone if you do this and suddenly you don't have a site anymore. But also, what do you accomplish by uh, kicking them out from this platform? I don't think you stop this market. Uh, this market will exist in some form or another and probably will go uh, to the dark web or to go to other sites that are of less quality, less transparency. Well, that's always been the core philosophical or moral argument behind the legalization of prostitution at its at perhaps one of its most extremes, right? You're not gonna get rid of this stuff. And so making yourself feel good and ethical by refusing to associate with, with it, while at the same time actually hurting the very people you purport to be helping, it strikes me as moral posturing. So another example in which uh, shaming doesn't work. Yeah, yet another example in which shaming doesn't work. But I like that this played out publicly so we could all see what happened and, and, and think about it. And if we believe that economic decisions are part of the core of capitalism, then this, in the end, seems to be a pretty pure 
pure case of the economics winning at, at, at the end of the day, with, again, the caveat that the piece of it I don't understand is why the payment processors reversed their their position. But I understand why OnlyFans did, did what it did in response both to pressure from its payment processors and then in response to the realization that it was going to lose an enormous chunk of their business. And that seems to me like a capital, a capital is. I agree. Even if I think that part of the reason why the Visa massacre have so much power is because they are an oligopoly. And so they can exert undue pressure on uh, yes. what takes place. That's the part of uh, capital is it. Yes, I agree. I agree with you. I see nothing wrong with people making choices that are in accordance with their own values. But when companies have so much power that they can literally dictate the, 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 way, the way the world goes based on their own, whatever their own values might be, that's a dangerous situation. Even if you agree with their values in some cases, you also have to accept the possibility that with other decisions, you, you, you may not agree with their, their values. One of the things I am wondering, though, if I weren't on the side of the OnlyFans workers in this case, if I thought they were being exploited and they needed this move to protect them, would I be intellectually consistent? Would I still say this was a capital is? And I'm not quite sure of that, that answer. I agree. So why Visa and Massacre don't stop sales of the charges on automatic uh, guns. Uh, because right, they, they, exactly. They, they could do that. Exactly. And so I think I think it's really shocking how much um, <laughs> hypocrisy there is in the world, right? And I'm, I, I try to be aware of it in myself. I'm not always perfect about that, but I try to be aware of it. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to Capital Isn't.